Paul talks about is judging yeah. angels. What is that part? How does it fit into this whole divine council worldview? Hey, 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 you guys, this is Brandon, and we're opening up for another dynamic show. We have a special co-host on here, BT Wallace. Hey, BT, how you doing? Doing well. Got my coffee ready to roll. Yeah, yeah. He just started a new podcast called Truth and Shadow, and it, it's pretty lit, and we are promoting it and putting it out there because we look at it that the more faith-based podcast we have, the more the gospel and the more the Word of God gets to the world. Our guest today is going to do us a really special favor, and I asked him to do this, and he is the perfect guy for the job. And let me tell you, it's Doug Van Dorn. But let me tell you why Doug is the perfect guy for this, because he is both a pastor and a theologian. And so he has his feet in both these worlds so he can understand some things that are ginger that theologians don't understand, and then some things that, that, that pastors understand as well. And so I appreciate his perspective on this. We're going to dive into the Divine Council worldview, but my goal is for Doug to kind of lay it out like a, you know, you remember like, I don't know if they still make them. 20 years ago, they made these books like Electronics for Dummies or whatever for dummies. Well, what we want to kind of do with this show is for noobs and people who need a soft place to get familiar with this whole concept. We're going to talk about uh, Divine Council worldview for dummies. And Doug is the man for this because he can take complex things and make them simple. That's that dual nature of a theologian and a pastor. Thanks, Doug, for being here today. We're glad to have you on the show. Glad to be back, Brandon. It's always fun yep. to be with you guys. Yep. Yep. It's always fun to be with you because you're just funny. Yeah. Funny dude. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, so what is the Divine Council worldview by your definition. And well, I tell you what, let's back up. What got you into this, Doug? And what is your journey into the Divine Council worldview? And then we can go from there. How about that? Well, you know, I think I had some indoctrination, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. without even realizing it um, for several years, actually. So I suppose this was about 20 years ago. I was reading a lot of an Old Testament scholar named Meredith Klein. Oh yeah, and it was a reform reform dude. Right, writes a lot on He's the awesome. temple and yep. and um, yep. the Holy Spirit and stuff like that. So this guy, um, anytime a divine council passage would come up, he would actually mention it. He, you know, he talks about it in Genesis one twenty six. Let us make man in our image. Yeah, and uh, you know Zechariah with the um, rider and the myrtle trees and that kind of stuff. And and I never, I never even realized I was reading. I was reading him talk about the divine council. It was really surreal. And I only came to understand that later when I found Dr. Heiser and his uh, book that he was giving away for free on the internet called The Myth That Is True to his mm. followers on his um, website. And this is the book that ended up becoming The Unseen Realm. But, uh, you know, I, I found that book really on accident. I found him on accident. And if you want to call it that, it's Providence, really. But Mm -hmm. probably, probably great providence when I start start thinking about all the things that it's led to in my life. But um, uh, you know, reading through his myth that is true version of the unseen realm, you know, it's in your face. Divine divine councils everywhere, and and suddenly it struck me that I think I've read about this before, <laughs> and so I, I'm like, Meredith Klein couldn't possibly be talking about this, could he? And I go back to some of those passages, and sure enough, he even he even calls it the divine council, but he never talked about it at any length at all. It, he treated it like you knew exactly what he was talking about, and you just moved on. But I have a feeling, you know, he passed on 2007 or something like that, but mm -hmm. I have a feeling that he was just kind of coy about it and didn't want to go deep into it because he knew how... Um, a lot of theologians respond to this whole idea of the divine council, which is often not very favorably. Yeah. So in Old Testament scholarship with Heiser and Klein and those kind of guys, it's not a problem. Everybody knows what the divine council is. It's just stock imagery of the Old Testament and of, and of the ancient Near East and, and any kind of mytholo mythological religion. But as soon as you move out of 
the realm of exegesis and, and studying the scriptures proper and you move into theology, then you can, you can get yourself into trouble. So I think that that's why he, he kept it pretty, pretty secretive, even though it, he wasn't, it's not like he, it's not like he was embarrassed, I don't think, but he just didn't, I think he didn't want to, he didn't want to go there. He didn't want to have to explain to people what, why he was bringing this up. Well, let me ask you this, Doug. Is it pretty common in, in uh, Judaism as well? Is it is it pretty pervasive there, or is it smaller than it is in, in, in our, our circles? You mean modern Judaism or, or ancient Judaism? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I would say um, it's totally not non-existent in modern Judaism. Okay, um, okay. If you get into Kabbalah, yeah. you know, kind of more esoteric stuff, I think you'll find it quite a bit. Um, and if you go back and look in the Targums and... And uh, their notion of the 70, which we'll talk about as we get into this, the, the importance of the number and yeah. those kinds of things. Certainly they knew about it and talked about it. I mean, the whole Sanhedrin is based on it, for crying out loud. Yep. Wow. I didn't yeah. know that. Cool. You, yeah. yeah. 70 members 70. of the Sanhedrin with one uh, ruling um, elder or whatever. That's not a coincidence that there's 70 sons of God in the divine council with one high God over it. You see, that just amazes me. I, I probably read right over that in the unseen realm. I've like read it once and listened to it twice. And, and I, I never saw that. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. This is the, this is like the major storyline that I love to tell people. So as we go through it, that's, I mean, I don't know, maybe that's how we'll finish or whatever, but yeah, just to, if you could put divine council worldview in a, like a paragraph definition to define it for us. Somebody on the streets. You know how, you know, remember, what was it, Jay Leno? It used to be people on the streets. If you had to explain, <laughs> I don't know if you yeah. want to explain it to those people, but, but if you had to explain it um, to a layman of the pews, how would you explain it in, in a paragraph? Oh, you can do it one sentence. The Divine Council is um, basically this ruling assembly of heavenly beings right. that meet in, in heavenly places or in, um, in between places, like uh, a cosmic mountain, sort of yeah. an idea, yeah, uh, to administer the affairs of the cosmos. That's basically okay. what it is. So, and you can make it even easier. Anybody who knows anything at all about Greek mythology and Mount Olympus, that's the Divine Council. Um, uh, the, that's the Greek version of it. So Zeus being the head, and then you got the twelve gods, and every once in a while you might have a an extra god come and offer on or whatever. But um, what what's their purpose? They sit around in a circle. Kind of like King Arthur, the Knights of the Round Table, and they just deliberate over the affairs of the earth and men. It's that simple. It's that simple. Now, in this divine council, because we have a, we have a what we would call a rebellion of sorts that happens in this divine council. Um, not really right now, but back before the rebellion, were 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 the rebellious ones in this council as well. Is this like what some people call the courts of heaven, Doug? Are you familiar with that? I've heard of that. Uh, well, you know, you have First Kings, I think it's 22, and the prophet Micaiah. Yeah. And they're kind of in the courts of heaven there. That's a divine council scene. Or Isaiah 6, where he's up there and he sees the seraphim and they touch his lips and all that. That's a divine council scene. So if that's what you're referring to, then I know what you're talking about. If it's something else, then I'm curious. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what I'm talking about. That that that. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, well, it reminds me of Job too. The you know the beginning of Job when Hasatan came in, and, and I mean that's a discussion we could have whether that was the the real deal Satan or just a, a deceiver or adversary. But uh, anyway, uh, Doug, I have a question. I, is there a difference between what Islam believes as far as, I mean, do they have a, a divine council type? I know they have their jinn and all that kind of stuff. Do they have a divine council type uh, worldview as well? <laughs> That's a great question. I don't know that I know the answer to it. The only 70 that I know are the 70 virgins or the 70 <laughs> virginians <laughs> as the uh, joke has it. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Oh, yeah. That number though shows up again. That's, it, that's... No, it, it yeah, it totally is interesting that the numbers there. But you know, yeah. it, that's a Unitarian religion, just like mo modern um, Judaism is. So yeah, it's kind of difficult for me to think that they would have a any kind of an idea of the divine council. Although they do have the jinn, which are kind of the equivalent of the watchers, which yeah. might might allow for them to have a divine council. And this black rock, which is 
where in Mecca that they go and do something with. I mean, I don't know all the, the ins and outs of it, but it, it, it supposedly I've heard rumors that it has gin and, and dem- demons and spirits and gods and all kinds of stuff in it. Um, so yeah, I've always heard, and I don't know how true it is. I've always heard that, uh, uh, Islam, they won't couch for it, but they're more, is it henotheism? Henotheism, yeah. Yeah, he- henotheism, yeah. yeah then, then they are monotheism. What do you think about that? Is that true, or is that just a... Well, from what I remember, henotheism is the idea that there's one ruling God at a time. Uh, mm-hmm. Um, so I would say that modern Islam would not think that, because th- right. I think they would believe that Allah has been uh, the only God always. Mm-hmm. However... Yeah, I think my my opinion, I get this from a book called Moonotheism that you can get. I think you can still get it online. It's one of these thousand page books that this dude wrote. And um, so very hard to get through all of it, but you can kind of get the the view of it, just skimming it. But his idea is that Allah actually came out of a pantheon. So this right. lends itself to a to a um, henotheism and divine counsel thing, at least in the earliest stages of it. Yeah. And that, um, yeah, that he was actually the moon God, right? 360 gods gods for 360 gods. Exactly. And that has to do with the Kaaba and all that kind of stuff. So it's possible, you know, that, that it originally came out of henotheism or something like that, but then it just kind of turned into this rigid monotheistic Unitarianism. Hmm. Yeah. I, I spent some time learning, Nakshabandi Sufism when I was in my early 20s. And that's a Sunni belief system. And they would tell you, no, there wouldn't be a divine council in that sense. It was Allah, and then that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, back to, uh, I think we kind of got out of the realm of dummies <laughs> here, <Yeah>. but <laughs> back no. down to, to, to um, Earth here a little bit uh so we've established that there's a divine council of 70 okay so i've been asked this numerous by layman uh why why did god create and and they also asked me why god created angels if he can just do everything and 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 i mean my answer was really fledgling i mean it was just like because he wanted to just why did he create people because he wanted to he wanted sons and daughters and sons and that was my answer. So, Doug, what do you think? Why, why did he create this, this layer of, of this council and all that kind of stuff instead of just him solitarily sitting on a throne with, with no help? Let's be careful in how we say that because God's never solitary since he's trying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes, yes. Right. Three persons, yes. So, so yeah, it's not, it's not that he did it out of loneliness or anything like that. God has eternal fellowship with the, the persons in the Godhead. Mm-hmm. Um, but everything God does is for his own glory. If, if mm-hmm. we want to put it at an ultimate purpose, yeah. that's, that's the ultimate, maybe the first cause or something like that of why he would, why he would do it. Um, right. it, I would say it's an overflow of his love. Um, mm. God, God creates whatever he creates because he's, he's just overabounding in loving kindness. And, and so that just kind of, I, I won't say necessitates because he does of his own will, but Right. And nevertheless, he, he creates because he wants to do that. And then, like, I think you were on the right track there. He, he created us and he created angelic beings because he, uh, he wanted to share his, um, be careful how I say this uh, with, without having to get into a lot of context of it, but he, wanted, he wants to share his divinity, not in terms of making us God, but in terms of union with Christ, that kind of thing. Yeah, put in evangelical terms. Partakers, um, partakers of the divine Peter nature. Writes. Peter says it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, he wants to show this incredible drama and play and script that he has written, that has bad guys and good guys, and that ultimately he and especially um, the Son, the second person, the Trinity, yeah. are maximally glorified in all that they do, and that mm-hmm. that helps to explain kind of the next question is, which is, you know, why did they fall? Yes. Why did they fall, Doug? <laughs> Which <laughs> time? <laughs> well, so, so you've got a storyline here. Um, yes. It's important to say that, you know, as we talk about the Divine Council, like, what, what are these creatures? Um, maybe we should start there, that the Divine Council of Heavenly Beings, they're called all kinds of names 
or given titles in the scripture. Um, they're called gods with a little G, but it's the same word that's used for the God of the Bible, Elohim. Um, but they're also called things like uh, sons, sons of God. Uh, they're called watchers. They're called rulers, princes. They're called um, authorities or thrones or principalities or dominions or authorities, powers, all kinds of titles that are given to them. Most of those titles have in their, in their nature um, that these, these creatures are given some sort of authority to rule yes, uh, over, over whatever sphere that God gave to them, which I think is the heavenly sphere. So think of it like that. God creates this universe, and then he creates these sons to rule over it. But that's really all prelude to what we get in the scripture, where we start in Genesis chapter 1, and God has this earth here, and it's full of water and chaos, and all of a sudden he starts creating this amazing place, and then he puts this man made of dirt um, into this place, and then he gives this man dominion and authority Mm -hmm. to rule down here and you go to Mm. like uh luke's gospel where adam is you know he's giving the genealogy of jesus and the last name he gives is adam the son of god so adam's given the same title as a son and to have sonship means that you will have an inheritance and you will have authority to rule because you're a prince prince of the king Mm. and so god gives this authority to rule uh, to humanity, um, he gives us the earth. And that's really what Genesis 1 is about. But it's such an incredible place. It's unlike anything else anywhere that I think that you have the other sons of God, at least some of them, at least one of them, mm-hmm. and I think probably more, more than yes. one, yeah. um, get very upset about this. And they're like, um, excuse me, I'm the most beautiful creation in the in the universe i'm lucifer and Mm -hmm. why didn't you give me this place this is a beautiful place why give it to this ball of dirt Mm -hmm. and god says i have to explain myself to you and so satan gets very upset and he tempts our parents to sin um and at the same time i believe that he actually fell into sin at real probably at the same time out of jealousy and pride because of what god did for us so this whole idea of a heavenly family an earthly family, all called sons of God. They're all created beings. They're princes. They're giving authority to rule over heaven and earth. God gives us the earth. He did not give them the earth, but we fell into sin and we abdicated that authority, at least to some degree. Not not fully, I don't think, right. but to some degree. Um, nevertheless, the uh, the right, the the birthright, if you want to call it that, to, to uh, rule down here, it was never like, it's always been ours. Right. It, it was never like taken away from us and then given to them. However, at some point in time, and it seems to be that that point in time is after the flood at the Tower of Babel, um, God decides he's had enough of man's continually going after other gods, other fallen angels, if you want to call them that. And so he gives them the right to rule over us Mm -hmm. down here. And this is where the nations are created and the gods are given to the nations. Now that's found in Deuteronomy 32, uh, verse 7 and 8. Yeah, And this is Moses' song. And, um, And this is where the number 70 comes from. So in that verse... You know, Moses is basically asking uh, us to remember this time long ago, remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations, ask your father, he will show you the elders and they will tell you when the most high, this is the word El Elyon, it's the name, it's the title really given for, for the father, um, whenever Gentiles are in the context and it means the most high. So the, when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance. So the nations are inheriting something. What are they inheriting? He divides up mankind. He fixes the borders of the peoples. Now you go, well, now wait, long ago he divides mankind, he fixed the borders. That has to be Tower of Babel. And sure enough, that's exactly what he's talking about. This is where the number 70 comes from. Because if you go back and read Genesis 10, 
and you count up the number of nations and the number of um, table sons nations, of Noah. Yeah. yeah, the table nations, the number of sons of Noah that are there, you get 70. Uh-huh. Right? And so this become the number that's associated with these heavenly beings, because as the, as the end of the verse reads, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God, which is the original reading. Some people might see sons of Israel. That is a later Jewish um, interpretation Gloss. that was meant to um, basically blind people's eyes from seeing this supernatural worldview, to be honest, because uh, mm. it, it, it's into this sons of God that you find Jesus Christ coming along and calling himself mm-hmm. the son of God. Yeah. Which is very clearly a heavenly being. This is the term that the demons use of him. They know fully well that he's the son of God. He's a heavenly being. And uh, so by turning this into sons of Israel through just an interpretation, all of a sudden you've desupernaturalized that text. You've taken away the angels that rule over the nations and you've made it completely normal. And uh, they did that because that's how much they hated Jesus. <laughs> Is this the whole Masoretic uh, text or type thing where that's they changed? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the Trinitarian yeah, so the, stuff. The too. Hebrew yeah. Masoretic text says uh sons of israel that our our earliest copy that only goes back about a thousand years when we discovered the dead sea scrolls and we also have uh, many copies of septuagint that are hundreds and hundreds and even thousand year older than the masoretic yeah they they will either say the sons of god or they'll say the angels of god right mm. yeah alan siegel in his book the two powers confronts this argument head on as a jewish scholar himself Exactly. Yeah, I had a question for you, Doug. So, with the Divine Council worldview, and we see this kind of, the kind of falling out of favor, if you will, what would become the new significance with the prophets and messengers or other intermediaries in the Divine worldview? Okay, so I think Jeremiah addresses this. This is Jeremiah twenty three eighteen. Hmm. He says, for who among them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and to hear his word? Who has paid attention to his word and listened? Well, Jeremiah is talking there about the false prophets. Right. And what he's doing is he's saying that the, the definition of a true prophet of God is that he stands in the counsel of the Lord. Now, this is not counsel, S-E-L. It's counsel, C-I-L. This is referring to the plurality. Um, of the heavenly beings. This is yeah. de- referring to those who are administering the affairs of the cosmos. Right. And what, what the prophet is doing there is, is he is able to hear God's word and see God's word. <laughs> How do you see the word? Because the <laughs> mm-hmm. word is Christ. Mm-hmm. And in the Old Testament manifestation, he's the prince of Israel. He's the one who was given Israel to rule over. And, um, you know, there's a, a debate as to whether Michael, the prince of Israel, that's my opinion of Michael, uh, whether or not he ruled the council at that time or whether or not the ruler of the council is El Elyon, the Most High. To me, it doesn't matter too much either way, as long as we know that, that God himself is the one who is uh, in authority over the, over the divine council. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's important. Yeah. So, all right, let's journey into the the fall, I suppose, or the different falls, the different ones. Um, so how did all this affect? I mean, I know we he put seventy people over the different nations. Are these seventy rulers? Are they all um good or, or are they evil or is it uh, a that mixture? Is a great question. Yeah, yeah. Well, it would it would be a layman's question. I've been asked that. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um I think this one's diff- kind of difficult to know the answer to. I guess right. my answer would be that, that they're not all of equal levels of evil. Okay. Mm. If you want to put it like that. Um, yeah. So I guess a couple of thoughts. Psalm 82 is probably the, uh, well, it's certainly one of the epicenters of this whole idea mm-hmm. of the divine council and who it is that's ruling. So when you read that, and this is the ESV, which is helpful because it uses the language. Uh, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. 
So God is standing in the midst of other entities that are also called Elohim. He's not standing in the midst of himself holding judgment. God doesn't need to judge himself. Right. So he, so Elohim is taking his place in the divine council and he's judging the gods. For what? How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? And um you know he goes a couple more verses that, that basically say you're not taking care of the, the fatherless and the widow and the needy. Mm-hmm. You're not delivering them from the wicked. Well one of the common objections people have is like, well, gods don't do that. And what I want to turn around and say is, of course they do. How many times in the Old Testament, in the law, in the Psalms, do you read that God is the God of the fatherless and the widow and the orphan? Mm-hmm. That's, his whole, that's his whole purpose. Right. Is to do the very thing here that they're not doing. And by the way, the God that's doing that is not the father, it's the son. Because yeah. the son is the one who inherits Israel. So in that verse back in Deuteronomy 32, 8, the very next verse says, but the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. Now, wait a minute. And this is something Dr. Heiser, I never heard him talk about this. I never saw, I never read this in anything he said, but it seems inescapable to me. If the sons of God are inheriting the nations in the previous verse, and the God, the Lord in verse 9 is receiving his allotment, his inheritance, then by definition, the Lord in that verse must be the Son of God. Right. Wow. It cannot be the Father. It cannot just be God in his bare essence. It has to be the Son of God. And therefore, yes, and therefore, whenever you read about God giving um, justice to the weak and the fatherless and the orphan and the destitute and all this. It is the son of God that is doing that. He is the parallel to the sons of God, not doing what they were supposed to do in Psalm 82. Now your question was about how wicked are they? And I go back to somebody like Plato and I don't have the quote exactly in front of me, but it's found in the Timaeus. And in this section, Plato is actually, he's actually almost quoting from Moses. And uh, by the way, Justin Martyr and other early church fathers said that, well, Plato came across Moses, probably through his great-grandfather Solon, who traveled from Egypt back to Greece, almost certainly going through Israel when he did it. And so he would have encountered the writings of Moses. Well, he, Plato says that, look, um, what when God divided up mankind according to the number of the sons of God, <laughs> we got Hephaestus and Athena. And um, he says about that that we got them because ours is a land full of beauty and culture and wisdom. <laughs> well, when you read that, what I think is interesting about it is he basically makes it sound like these are not too bad of gods. They're, they're pretty good. They're not, they're not, they didn't rule us very wickedly. However, it's the same Plato, among so many others, who talked about the Golden Age, and then the Golden Age turns into the Silver Age, it turns into the Bronze Age, and it just everything collapses. And I think yeah. this is really kind of what Psalm 82 may be getting at, that yep. maybe originally there was a lot better ruling, and over time their pride, their arrogance, their hubris, their a desire for worship got the better of them, and they started ruling less and less righteously and more and more wickedly. Yeah. And if that's true, then I think you would expect to see that some of them got more wicked and some of them, uh, the degree of it would have been less. But I don't think that there would be any such thing in these 70 as an unfallen ruler over okay. the nations. It's not like it's not like Fiji's the lone holdout, right? That has <laughs> hey, our our God is actually not fallen, right? Yeah. Something like Let's that. Let's go there. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, well, uh, well, go ahead, BT. Yeah, so I was going to say in in Exodus when we have Aaron making that golden calf for the people and you see, you know, Moses is pretty pissed off about this. And these people are are you know they're doing a wicked act, and so it makes me think that the wickedness that the ones talked about in Psalms are receiving the sacrifices due to God alone, basically receiving blood sacrifice, and that seems to be what's really angering God is the reception of blood from sacrifice. 
to the divine council. Um, I don't know that I would say that the uh, golden calf episode necessarily did that because Moses says, let's have a feast to Yahweh. However, uh, there's no doubt that very quickly after that and <laughs> throughout the rest of the Old Testament, that's exactly what they're doing. So by the time you get to you know, the, the wicked kings of especially Israel, mm-hmm. well, and later Judah, uh, they're all sacrificing their own sons and daughters in the fires to Molech and other, right. and other sorts of entities. All right, Doug, I have a question. This is not very, <laughs> we're good. This is not, this is quickly becoming not divine counsel for dummies, but that's okay. I, I won't, I want to go where the Holy Spirit wants to go. I have a question for you here that it just hit me like a ton of bricks. If like we read in Heiser, his book on Hermon, uh, is it uh, answering Hermon? No, what is it called? Reversing Hermon. Reversing, yes, exactly. Well, that's an important word. <laughs> Reversing Hermon, okay. All right. If I'm a heretic, y'all just shoot me down, okay? Because I, I I can accept it. Uh, was he also reversing not only in the hum, human realm, but possibly even in the sons of God realm? Was he also becoming the son of God with power, like like for Israel? And he's he's also revert. I know they're not being redeemed. That's not what I'm saying. But could he be re? Versing the entire uh, epic, so to speak. And part of that was to be a ruler over a nation in a righteous way versus the other 70. Do you see what I'm saying? Could that be an aspect of it, Doug? So are you asking about other fallen sons of God, heavenly beings? Yeah. What I'm asking is, did Jesus or, or Yeshua, did he recapitulate so to speak or reverse what the other fallen sons of god did before he came and before he did it for us is this is the recapitulation wider in scope other than just humanity i guess is what i'm trying to ask oh certainly it's wider than just humanity it's all creation i mean paul makes this pretty clear in romans 8 i mean the whole creation groans for the sons of god to be revealed but what happens when the sons of God are revealed? Well, all creation is made new, all creation. So that would include, you know, whatever loyal, if you want to call them that. I like, I like the term loyal angels, you know, somebody like uh, Raphael <laughs> right. and the other teenage mutant ninja turtles. <laughs> <laughs> loyal angels. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, but- the, the archangels of Roman Catholicism, like, I don't know that I would say that they're sinless, but I'd say that they were completely loyal to the Lord. They never, mm. they never gave up that loyalty. And so, you know, mm. and Paul also talks about elect angels. Like, what do you need elect angels for if they never fall in the first place? I, I, that doesn't really make a lot yeah. of sense to me. So yep. somehow yep. Jesus, Jesus' work is definitely um, encompassing all of the cosmos, not just us, but we're at the center of that. Well, right. in some ways they are too. They're, they're kind of the first center of it. So, you know, I, I think it's just, so vitally important to understand in the worldview that Jesus is the Son of God and the Son of Man simultaneously. Mm -hmm. He has to be both. And it's not just that he's the Son of God, meaning that he is God, but he's the Son of God, meaning he's one of them. Yeah. He's one of the heavenly hosts. Yeah. He he is the ruler. He's the prince of Israel. Why is that so important? And and maybe this gets to your question. That's why I thought about it. Because if God gave them some sort of divine rule uh, over men, then right. somebody had to carry that out perfectly. Yes. Yes. Yep. And none yep. of them did. It's the same idea that we reform people have in the covenant of works, that God gives a covenant of works in the Garden of Eden. And the whole idea is that somebody has to carry this out perfectly because this is what holiness demands. It demands perfection, perfect right. righteousness. Mm-hmm. And man, every man that's ever come along has blown it. We've all fallen short of the perfect righteousness in that covenant of works, except for Jesus. So people will you know, often say, well, we're not saved by works. And I want to say, well, that's true in one sense, but it's not true in another. I'm saved by the works of Christ because he had to obey that covenant of works for me. Well, in the same way, I, it makes a lot of sense to me that Jesus had to obey this. And, and quite honestly, this, I kind of write about this a little bit in my um, 
covenant theology book, the covenant of works is the same covenant um, as the co- what we call the covenant of creation or the covenant of life. Right. Uh, Jeremiah talks about this as the covenant with the day and the night. Very interesting language. Yeah. Very. And what is that? Well, that's that's nature language. That's what Celestial, we today would yeah. call we would call that natural laws, you know, the law of yeah. gravity or something like that. But yeah. in in a biblical worldview, this the angels are the ones that are over this. And yeah. and they've blown it. Like the whole cosmos is in great upheaval because the laws of nature have not been followed by these guys. But somebody did follow them perfectly in that heavenly aspect in the in the angelic rule over his people. And uh, so in that sense, if it, in, and especially if it's part of the same covenant, it's just that, you know, when we talk about covenant of works, we're focusing in on um, Adam. But if you talk about it in terms of covenant of life, now it's, it's encompassing all of creation. Cosmology, the whole thing yeah. has to be obeyed, the whole thing. So it makes a lot of sense to me that Jesus is obeying that at every possible level. That's what I was getting at. Yep, you nailed. You answered my question. Yeah, I, I just couldn't see it as uh, just being a strictly human thing, and, and that that's that's one of the, the problems I have a lot with uh, some of us evangelicals is we want to be so God centered and God glorifying, but we end up focusing so much on ourselves and not the whole cosmology and and everything else. And 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 that would be something I would suggest if Doug would agree with me about this that. The whole divine council worldview, it actually expands the fence of the kingdom of God. It makes it realize that, that there's a lot more to it than just us waiting for heaven when we die, you know, which we all know that's the truncated gospel kind of thing. But but there's a vastness to it without it becoming, uh, I don't know, there's an epicness to it, if that makes any sense. And... Uh, this this worldview did that to me. It opened my eyes to the world and, like you said, the covenant of creation and and all that kind of stuff that just blew me out of the water. And it started with a question that somebody asked me, said, why did God make angels? And that's what got me started looking at this. Uh, why? And, uh, and so anyway, that that's why I followed that kind of train of thought with those questions for you, Doug, is to is these are things that I asked when I was first, you know, trying to comprehend the divine council worldview. All right. I want to switch gears here a little bit um, and then do one more thing. Uh, How does this work in the scheme, in your opinion, Doug, of the whole first Corinthians we're reading? I have a group of guys we're reading first through first Corinthians right now. It talks about, and I think it's in first Corinthians talks about us judging angels. Paul talks about us judging angels. how, How does that, what is that part and how does it fit into this whole divine council worldview? Cause you know, it does, it doesn't make sense without it. So can you help us out there? Yeah. Let me, let me kind of go do two mm-hmm. things here. The, fir- the first one is to see Christ. And then the second one is to see us. Mm-hmm. And I do this because Christ is the head and us meaning his church are the body. Right. So in, in that, um, Deuteronomy 32, 9, but the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted inheritance. Okay, so at the original allotment, all that the angel of the Lord, all that the Son of God received was Israel. Now you take this over to Psalm 2, and you see an expansion of it. So Psalm 2 is that famous psalm, um, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? You know, this is Handel's Messiah. And um, then you get this famous verse that's quoted so many times in the New Testament. As for me, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. Mm-hmm. Now the key, the key verse here is verse eight. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage. So all of a sudden there's a promise, a prophetic promise of expansion from Israel to all the nations. Okay. All the nations. All the nations. And and it's promised to the son. Then you come to Psalm 82, and that's the psalm that we were in a minute ago. And the whole point of that psalm is that these heavenly beings are not judging well. And so God swears that they're going to die like men. But the last verse of Psalm 82 says, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. This is why the divine council matters so much, because 
without understanding that the princes, the sons of God, inherited the nations in the first place, and then understanding that they're judged, and then understanding this is all divine counsel stuff, it's into that context that the Son of God is then understood to inherit Israel, which did not exist at Babel. God created Israel of nothing. So he actually, he actually did this miracle in giving Israel to the Son of God in the first place. It's very reminiscent of how he's going to carry out the promise with Israel through Abraham. I'll make you the father of many nations. But through who? Not through Ishmael. Through Isaac, who can't, who can't even possibly be born because it's not physically possible unless there's a miracle, right? And so now in the disinheriting of these heavenly rulers, the Son of God will inherit all the nations. That's the sun side of this whole deal, okay? Mm-hmm. Now, when Jesus comes as the Son of God and the Son of Man, and he then obeys perfectly everything that he needs to obey in what we just talked about, going all the way to the cross and then rising from the dead, then what he does is he reconstitutes certain human beings that have faith in him, and he makes them into sons of God. This is, I mean, Galatians 3, 27, you know, you're all sons of God through faith. And um, Romans 8 uh, that we brought up earlier, that the sons of God are going to be revealed. Um, Jesus says the sons of God are the meek who will inherit the earth. I mean, what is, what's going on here? Well, this is the extension of what Jesus gets in his person that's now given to his brothers, as Hebrews 2 and Psalm 22 call us. We're his brothers. We're, we're united to him. And so now this is where the whole 70 thing comes in, and it's really cool. Mm-hmm. So the original number was 70 because of the Tower of Babel and the nation's Tower of Babel. That 70 then has a foreshadowing in, I think it's Exodus 24. This is the story where Moses and his brother Aaron and his four sons and 70 elders of Israel go to the top of Mount Sinai and they get to see God and eat with him. Well, why 70? And why are they going a half up a mountain? Because that's where the divine council meets. It's Mount Olympus. It's Mount Eden. It's mm-hmm. a Mount Zion. It's Mount Sinai at that point. This is where the divine council is. So they're, given, they're being given a seat at the table, but the 70 is symbolic of more than just a seat at the table. It's symbolic of, I'm going to do something through you, 70, that's going to shake the heavens and the earth. That 70 then. Uh, gets transferred to to in the intertestamental period to the seventy members of the Sanhedrin. Now these are the Jewish ruling council, and um, the the priests of Aaron, which are really an extension of the twenty of Exodus twenty four and the seventy elders there. But then, in the New Testament, all of a sudden, when Jesus is on his way down to Jerusalem. He sends 70 disciples ahead of him. Why does he do that? Because they're to go out and spread the good news. These are the representatives that are spreading the good news. They're going to be the ones that are the initial 70 that are um, responsible for bringing that initial group of new believers into the family of God. That 70 then is taken in the book of Acts, in a symbolic way, through the nations. And this is something that Heiser does a great job with near the end of his Unseen Realm book to help us see this, that at the beginning of the book of Acts, you have um, all the nations under heaven basically being represented in Jerusalem when Peter preaches his sermon. That's not an accident. It's very, very important to Luke's story there. All these Jews from Rome and Bithynia and Pontus and Galatia, all these places are there. They hear Peter, they're converted, then they go back to the nations, and the rest of the book of Acts is about these missionary journeys going out into the Roman Empire. And that Roman Empire is symbolic of the known world of the 70 nations. At the very end of the book, Paul is in Rome. 
And if you read the end of Romans, when he's in Rome, or when he desires to go to Rome, he says, man, I really want to go to Spain. That's the last place God wants me to go is to Spain. But end of Romans doesn't tell you that he ever went to Spain. And end of Acts doesn't tell you that he ever went to Spain. Church history tells us that he did go to Spain. But why does Spain matter? It's because Spain is the last place on earth that needs to be reached. It's this, you can think of it this way. It's the 70th nation. Well, church history tells us that he went there, but the scripture doesn't because it's leaving open for us the whole idea that our job in the Great Commission as those who inherit uh, the apostolic um, gospel is not finished until Christ returns. But in, in keeping that in front of our minds, what it's saying is, look, the 70 nations will be reached with the gospel. And as they're reached, there's going to be a reconstitution of the divine council. I've disinherited those sons of God. Now, they may still be ruling today. I believe that they are in some capacity, whether they're, whether they're under house arrest, uh, you know, my idea of the binding of Satan and it extends to them, or whether they've actually been unleashed and we're living in that last little time in Revelation 20, I don't know. Um, but whatever the case is, uh, at that final judgment, when Satan and all these guys are thrown into the lake of fire forever and ever, the sons of God, the 70, the, his people, his brothers, the church, all these things are symbolic of that. We then become the rulers of the divine council in their place. And this is why Paul says, don't you know, you will judge angels. It's a reversal of everything that happened um, starting at the fall when we abdicated our authority and God gave them rule. God, through Jesus, uh, is, is about the business of reconstituting the whole thing and putting us back into our rightful place, but so that Jesus is the one who is glorified as the only Son of Man and the only Son of God who obeyed the whole thing. Wow. That's a good encapsulation of the narrative. That makes sense. I mean, that, that makes this sense. This is why the Divine Council is so important to me, because it explains that it explains the really the whole storyline of of evangelism and why that matters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I see that. Totally. Yep. That blow you away? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Well, it's the, the fact that humans are good to be the replacement. We are designed and destined to be the replacement divine council. Yeah. That's... After Christ. I mean, we, we, we gloss over that passage in Corinthians. We almost treat it like we do the... And you're going to laugh at this, BT, the baptism of the dead, Pat. We're like, oh, we don't know what that means. What does that mean? You know, we gloss right right through yeah. that passage. But that passage is is important. And, and uh, we see the wider scope of what God's redemptive plan is through that. And, and Corinthians is definitely there. I mean, I, I almost wonder if he's sometimes saying, you guys are petty. And look, you're going to judge angels one day. You can't even judge yourselves. You, you're, yeah. you're too. You're petty. And look what you're going to do. You're part of this big cosmological epic, and you're going to judge the divine ruler. You know, I guess. Yeah, be you'll, you'll be ruler. judging Zeus and Athena and Apollo, guys. Yes. What is your problem? Yes. <laughs> any name. Yeah. Any name. Yeah. Any name below the name of Jesus. Yeah. That. That's. That totally gives that phrase phraseology total new aspect too Uh, (laughs) completely (laughs) yep so uh all right well let me um wrap this up with a a question and it it might be a you know you might have a long explanation you might not it doesn't matter i just i'm just curious this i want you to put on your pastor hat and 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 say um you had parishioners in your church and and you weren't into this divine council. You had heard, well, that Heiser's kind of out there, you know, or the divine council is not biblical, which I've been told. <laughs> I don't know where they get that from. Anyway, what advice would you give these parishioners? I mean, I I know that this is not the most important thing in a church, you know. I mean, it it, it like you said, it's it's intricate in understanding the story, but Jesus is the most important thing in the church, and that's 
one thing in my podcast that I'm trying to bring it back to. I love the fringe. I love that stuff. But Jesus, Jesus is just all right with me. I mean, he's number one. So, so <laughs> like a good doobie brother. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it, but so how would someone break through to you, Doug, or, or to begin to reach you with that? If, if you were not teaching it because. Yeah. We know. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's a tough question for me to, to answer because I know what broke me through yeah. and it was me being prepared in several different ways. I mean, I already spoke about, you know, what Meredith Klein was talking about with, uh, right. Um, with just mentioning the divine council, but that, you know, th- there was much more to it for me, for me personally, you know, there, he, he focused on the temple a lot. Like what is the temple and how does it extend beyond just this tabernacle temple complex? Like thinking about Eden and thinking about Ararat and thinking about Mount Sinai and thinking about the church oh, in the New Testament, all these things as the temple. Hebrews, the whole book of Hebrews. The, the whole book it, of Hebrews, yeah. Yeah, totally different. We think temple, he's thinking cosmological. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, I got it, yeah. So in other words, for me, it was, it was that. Um, for another friend, and this, uh, I'll just kind of use this as an anecdote for, as an illustration um, with my giant book. Um, yeah. I had a buddy who was very, very upset about me teaching giants. He's like, he just kind of threw the thing across the room. He's like, this is so stupid. This isn't even biblical at all. And I go, what do you mean okay. it's not biblical? I go, you believe in Goliath, don't you? Because mm-hmm. yeah, I knew he believed in Goliath. He's a very conservative guy. He goes, well, of course I believe in Goliath. I go, well, you ever looked in his genealogy? Well, this guy, you have to know who you're talking to, okay? That's one of the things you need to know uh, to answer your question. Know who your audience is. If your pastor's really struggling with this, you need to find a way to get to where he's at. My buddy loves genealogies. So that was a challenge to him that to somebody else, it may not be like, I don't care about his genealogy. Well, this guy cared, okay? And so I said, well, go look at his genealogy. Go look at it right now. His genealogy, oh, he's, from the, he's one of the sons of Rapha. Do you know who Rapha is? He's the, son, he's the father of the Raphaim. You know the Raphaim are? This is the Nephilim. What do you mean it's not biblical? And all of a sudden, the lights came on for him. My point is, you have to reach people at a place where they're already at. You can't just jump into this and expect somebody to just latch on. And I think maybe a good mm. illustration of why that's the case mm. is, is the Mormons, okay? So Mormons have something that's very similar in their language to a divine council. And in fact, yes, they, yes. They, they talk very much like what we're talking here. Oh, we're going to rule the universe yeah. one day, and yeah. we're the sons of God, yeah. and blah, blah, blah. Why? I actually think that the Mormons are one of the reasons why some of my evangelical and reformed friends can't accept this worldview. It's yep. because all they hear is Mormonism. Yeah. So yeah. somehow you have to find out what's going on in their head. Ask them, well, what's your objections to it? Try and get down to, you know, just ask them questions. Don't be belligerent about it. Don't be trying to force a worldview onto them. Really, honestly, enter into a conversation and try to understand where they're at. Like, what? I, I'm really curious as to why this makes you so upset, you know, because <laughs> it makes some people really <laughs> upset. Really or I'm really upset. curious as to why yeah. you think this is, is is a nothing burger like I, I really want to know because i think it's a something burger and just find out where they're at and see if you can track down you know maybe one or two presuppositions that's in their head that you can correct and say oh no this isn't mormonism mormonism's problem it's like it's like asking about michael and and saying well michael is the is the uh Prince of Israel, Michael is the angel of the Lord. And all of a sudden, some people get really mad because, oh, that's what the Jehovah's Witnesses believe. So if Jehovah's Witnesses believe it, it must be wrong. No, the problem isn't that they believe Michael is the angel of the Lord. The problem is that they believe that Michael and the angel of the Lord are a created being. Yes. That's the problem. So, yes. you, it, you know, it's like, it's like saying, well, the, the Catholic Church believes in the Trinity, so that's got to be a heresy because it's the Catholics who believe it. No. That's actually one of the things that they believe that's right, you know? So um, getting, getting things that are in people's heads that are stuck in there and, you know, like just some sort of a needle sitting in the saddle, burler saddle, you know, like just stuck in there and they can't get it out because it's this pain that's always there and never goes away. 
you got to find a way to relieve that pressure. <laughs> find a way to help them see that whatever this particular problem is that they think is a problem isn't actually a problem. That's my best advice to the to the oh, question that you have. Right, that's superb advice. What you don't want to be is that. Oh no, here comes here comes Mister So and So. He's gonna <laughs> he's gonna overwhelm me with divine counsel again. You don't want to be that guy. <laughs> so right, and I mean we you know I have a lot of um, practical experience with this as a Calvinist because we have the cage stage Calvinist right right. Yeah. And these are the guys that that's all they talk about ever, only, and forevermore. And <laughs> like, they just make everybody so angry. And I, you know, I was one of those guys and you don't even realize you're doing it because you are so into it. And you're like, man, this is such a cool thing. And I really want people to know this, but you're not realizing that you're actually totally obsessing in probably an unhealthy way on it and step back a little bit. The divine council is not the only thing in the world that there is. Yes. Yes. And, and those are the words from the blurry pastor. And I, I acknowledge that he is the blurry pastor. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, um, that's great advice. I mean, and what I really liked, what jumped out the most to me with your advice is how you use the Socratic method. You ask questions. Exactly. So often we want to come in. Um, we've read two or three Heiser's book. We've watched some YouTubes. And, and I know from seminary. We have education. I'm not saying that that's the, the best thing in the world, because I think that's also a part of uh, a pr the problem in the church's seminaries, too. It, anyway, another whole s rabbit hole. But, uh, <laughs> but w you know, you're not going to come at us with three YouTube videos and one book and, and, and a layman's explain <laughs> to us what that we need to believe this, you know, and, and I think you're right. Socratic method questions in relationship. That's it. That that's how we reach anybody for with anything. Right. I had a friend, a, a guy in our church who, um, um, left our church and ended up becoming, uh, basically a full fledged Gnostic. Mm. And started calling Christianity, this evil, you know, parasite religion, blah, blah, blah. So every once in a while, he spams me with these three hour long videos <laughs> on why Jesus never existed or something like that, you know? And then yeah. and with, the, with like this condescending language of, you really ought to take this seriously and think rationally about it. Uh, you know, so this is exactly how not to get somebody to believe what you think, okay? <laughs> Yes. Send them such a long video that they could never possibly ever want to watch it, right. let alone actually watch it, and then show them how stupid they are, it, whether they watch it or not. <laughs> That's not how you win somebody over. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. And, and, and my theory for that, even though I am one of these, is because eggheads run Christianity and eggheads think that we put a premium on knowledge and part of knowledge is having to be right. And uh, we've got to have some of these these uh, woo woo emotional people come into the the whole theological world. As much as I don't like that either, <laughs> but we yeah. it's like we we need the body, you know. We need the body. We need all of the above, and and we've we've allowed certain types of people to to only hone in on in certain areas, and that's created the the dilemma that we're in. But yeah, I hundred percent agree. There's a in. I just think about not necessarily. Well, I don't. I don't. I'm not sure how this is definitely related to what you're saying, but in my circles, it's sort of like the only doctrine that matters is doctrine of God. It's yeah. like ethics doesn't matter at all. It's not really a doctrine that God cares about. All God <laughs> cares about is what you think about divine simplicity. Yeah. Um, he doesn't care about the Ten Commandments. That's not like that's not doctrine or anything like that. It's not like love your neighbor as yourself isn't, isn't really doctrine. Of course it's doctrine. And it's the most practical doctrine in the world that there is. And we're supposed to love both yeah. of those kinds of things, not just one and not just the other. Absolutely. Absolutely. There was a guy in our Bible study this morning that left a lengthy message where he got to that. He said, look, the, the boots have got to hit the road. It can't just be you and Jesus. It's got to encompass others as well. And that's a good, good lesson for even the divine council worldview, because when we're trying to share the gospel, because I don't think that the divine council worldview by any means would be called the gospel, even though it is 
a gospel and is good news. It's not the essence. I, I, I subscribe yeah. to first Corinthians, but, but, uh, it's a way to get, it's a way to get at the gospel. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. But it's not the gospel itself. Yeah. It's a good way to get people who come from a pagan worldview to sure. come into. Absolutely. It's a great apologetic tool. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I mean, after all, if our pastor isn't talking about the divine, I mean, they're not leading anybody or lying to anybody or leading them astray about the salvation in Christ. And I think that's important too. If you're not yeah. getting the divine worldview, you're not, no one's leading you astray. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this, this was lost in the church in terms of an explicit way of thinking about it, like we're doing right now. A long this has time been lost ago. in the church for like 1,800 years. Yeah. yeah. What are we going to say, that everybody in between that time was just completely gone and going to hell because they didn't have <laughs> talk about the divine council every week? That's absurd. Well, the early church was concerned with staying alive for the most part or keeping the <laughs> message alive. I mean, they were just being killed left and right. Exactly. So yeah, it's like divine counsel is not exactly let's get let's get people to Jesus. Well, and it, it just cracks me up because in, in some circles, different places, uh, you know, I've I've heard this rumor like, oh, we need to start a divine dating app that only <laughs> yeah, right. about the divine counsel, you know, and 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 that it's like some women have have told their daughters like, okay, add. They must believe in the Trinity. They must believe in justification by faith. And they must believe in the divine council. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, so and I'm not knocking anybody. I know what it's like to be obsessed with stuff like you were talking about. Yeah. Doug, uh, I should have been caged up when I had my, quote, charismatic experience. You know, I mean, I was so zealous and I was going to convert everybody and I was obnoxious and and I was all this stuff. And. And I think that just eases as people mature, they begin to realize that, number one, the body of Christ is a lot bigger than we think it is. And number two, that what really matters is is people and these doctrines inform us how to really love people and love God. Yeah. And, and, and if we miss that, divine counsel or whatever, none of that matters. I mean, and that's just where I'm... And, and I don't mean that in some kind of woke, woo-woo, love wins kind of junk. Because love does win, but 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 thanks for not being the hippie Jesus, Brandon. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not hippie Jesus. Oh, but uh, yeah. Well, Doug, thank you so much. This was great. I mean, your your last five minutes was worth the price of admission, but the whole thing was awesome. Yeah. But just to hear from you as a pastor, uh, because I hear it all the time. People asking me, and I see it on when I'm in the blurry thread. People asking questions about how can I convince my pastor to, to believe this? And I'm like, all right, well, don't try to convince him. That's the number one no. thing you should do. Don't try to convince him. Right. Um, be his friend and talk to him about the things that are on your heart. There That's you the best thing that you can do because people know a scam when they see it. If you're, if your only purpose in getting to talk to your pastor is to get him to believe what you believe, that, that's the last thing that he's going to want to do. Yep. He's your pastor for crying out loud. He already thinks he's superior in knowledge that to you. Yeah. Just by his by his <laughs> office, Honestly. right? Yeah. Seriously. And yeah. so it's not it's not like and it's not it's not a dig on anybody. It's just that's kind of the way that's kind of the way, the way it is. People it think. Is. I mean, and it's it like when you're in any when you're in any job, you think you're better at that job than people who are not in that job, right? Yeah, so maybe. if you think you're gonna come into his office with all his books sitting in the back. And you just start talking to him about the divine counsel and change his mind. You got another thing coming. Yeah. I wish it, I mean, I, you know, because it's a true thing, I wish it wasn't that way, but it is that way. And because it is that way, maybe we need to step back and ask ourselves, well, maybe it's that way for a reason. Maybe God did this for a reason. Maybe God wants us to not just sit here and try and treat each other like brains and vats, but he wants us to treat each other like friends and human beings and, and get to know each other and do what Imagine friends that. are supposed to do. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Wow. And when you do that, it becomes very clear that, look, I'm just telling you what's going on in my head. And man, I'm like, man, this is so important to me. And I'm just, I want to know what's going on with you and what, what you think about it. And just yeah. kind of leave it at that. Let, let the Holy Spirit work. Let time work. It has an amazing ability to work on somebody's brain, even when they're not thinking about it. People ask mm -hmm. me, how, how often does it take you to prepare your sermons? And I'm like, I mean, it takes me X amount of time to write them, but it's taken me 25 years to prepare my sermons. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think about it all the time. 
Yeah. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, all of a sudden, my brain is thinking about something that I wasn't even thinking about. I was like, oh, wow, that's the answer to that question. Well, plant a seed. <laughs> plant a seed. That's plant maybe seed. all you need to do. Like <laughs> no, you're right. Yep. Mark four, plant a seed. Yep. Expect a crop. Yep. Boom. Yep. Well, Doug, thank you so much. It was awesome, as it usually is. I appreciate everything that you contribute to our unrefined friends and, and stuff out there. And, and uh, you guys, this was real basic Divine Council worldview stuff. If you want to go into deeper stuff, uh, Doug, do you have anything out there about the Divine Council? I mean, you have your Giants book. Yeah, that's, but, yeah, I guess kind of the introduction is a little bit about it. I did one chapter in The Angel of the Lord. Um, oh, nice. And yes. it's the angel of the Lord in the divine council. And that was probably the hardest thing I've ever written. I think I rewrote that five or six times because I wanted to get the whole thing distilled into one chapter as if that was even possible. But I think I did a fairly good job at it. And I'm, you know, I'm pretty proud of how the, that ended up coming out. So if somebody wants, oh, yeah, you know, my work that, on the divine council distilled, that's where you're going to get it. Well, and, and you guys, that book is worth reading anyway. I mean, I think it's his best book, but Angel of the Lord is, by far is one of my favorite books by Doug, just uh, how it's laid out and everything like that. The Giants book is great too, but I'm an Angel of the Lord fan. So, uh, And he's got some other good books out there on the creeds and the, and the, the solos and uh, tons of good commentary stuff. I used his Galatians commentary to preach on it. And yeah, How'd that go this, for you? It went well. It went well. Yeah, I love being able to throw in the bits and pieces of the fringy stuff, you know, instead of just justification by faith, Judaizers, you know, it was it was fun to bring <laughs> in that 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 background <laughs> stuff. So uh, do you have a I, I'm serious. Do you have anything on Colossians? That's what I'm about to preach on next. I've man. never. <laughs> no, I have not preached Colossians. I do have Ephesians. Yeah. And I really want to turn that into a book. Um, yeah, oh, yeah. It would, be, yeah. it would be very similar to the Galatians one. That was really fun. I looked at a, a bunch of crazy stuff, starting with Artemis, because one of the seven yep. wonders of the world was in Ephesus. Yep. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm convinced that when Paul talks about rulers and authorities in heavenly places, that he's got yeah. her in number one in mind. Right up front. Mm -hmm. It's hard to miss because it's right there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, that's the thing about idolatry, and we wonder why... In our culture, this is, we're getting way off topic again, but in our culture, why do they put it in our face? Well, they've always put it in our face for thousands of years. It's always. That's your liberty, baby. Yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's there. Yeah. How much yeah. more in your face can you get? Oh, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Doug, for being here today. We're glad to have you on the show. Thanks for listening and supporting us. And remember, stay naturally supernatural.